As a part of our new Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program's digital education program and initiative, we've started a new video and audio podcast series called Marine Program Digital Learning Podcast. This is our fourth show, and this week's topic is water quality. My name is Rory McNish. I'm CCE Marine Program's Media Specialist. This week's show will look at the role that aquatic plants and animals play in maintaining and improving water quality in our local waters. We will highlight the water quality initiatives and projects that Cornell Cooperative Extension's Marine Program is involved with, including public education and aquatic habitat restoration. Good morning, Mr. C. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day to you, Rory. Hard to believe Earth Day was 50 years ago. Hard to believe 1970 was 50 years ago. You excited about this week's show? Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, Good. Well, what I'd like to do first of all, for something different, Rory, I want to start off this week's show with a question for you. Okay. So, Rory, I'm going to ask you a question, and then we're going to do a demonstration. All right, cool. Well, I have two containers of water here, and I'll okay. show you in a second on my computer. All right. And what I want you to do is tell me which container of the water you think has cleaner water in it. Can you see the containers now? Yes. One's green, one's red. Okay. I say the red one. It looks clear, clean, very nice. The other okay. one is, ugh. All right. Why did you pick the red one? Well, like I said, it, it's clear. It's, it looks like it, you know, there's no sticks in it. There's, you know, the other one looks like you got it from, you know, a mud puddle or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, right? uh, well, I'm not saying where I got it from. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. Well, a lot of times when they check water quality, a lot of pollutants you really can't see. Right. So I'm going to do a little test here. I'm going to add a uh, reagent to the water. Okay. If the water changes color. That means that potentially there's a, a pollutant in the water. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. Ready? All right. Ready. Okay. Here we go. The red. Oh, oh, I see it now. It's turning red. It's yeah. turning red. Yeah. All right. What up with that? Well, as I said, in many places, uh, water pollution really can't see it. Mm -hmm. So that's why water quality monitoring is important and testing. So, for example, you know, around the country, there's a lot of concern about nitrogen uh, building right. up levels in our water, uh, groundwater or surface waters. And the nitrogen is actually called nitrates or nitrites. And um, what we're doing is uh, looking at this problem and where it comes from is actually from stormwater runoff. So when it rains, like today, we had rain overnight and today, any pet waste, for example, has nitrogen in it. Uh, excess fertilizer from lawns, for example, uh, can be picked up by the water and then carried into our groundwater and our surface water bodies. So okay. another example you know, of water pollution uh, that was in the past was uh, something called DDT. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember DDT, right? Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, DDT was obviously commonly used as a pesticide in the 1950s and 60s, you know, for pest control. Uh, it was really a wonder pesticide. It was great for, you know, killing mosquitoes. You know, it can cause a lot of diseases, obviously like malaria. So DDT was actually mixed with oil uh, and then sprayed in many environments, including, you know, freshwater lakes and ponds. Right. Uh, right. And also our, you know, local salt marshes to uh, kill mosquito larvae. So the other uh, negative aspect of that is obviously our local ospreys, which we talked about a few years, uh, weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, and other birds are you know, heavily affected by DDT. Right. Um, the DDT actually would accumulate in their bodies uh, and would cause their eggshells when the females laid the eggs to be so thin that when they sat on the eggs, the eggs actually cracked and then they didn't yep. hatch. There was a, a famous book, uh, I think it was called Silent Spring, written yep, by Rachel think, Carlson. You remember that yeah. book? Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Really, yeah. the environmental movement and uh, helped with the, you know, the first Earth Day. Yeah. Uh, and then in uh, 1972, DT, DDT was actually banned in the U.S. Yeah, and that started in Suffolk County. I think the first uh, court cases were uh, initiated in, uh, right in Hop Hog. And, uh, and that led to the fact that the ospreys have come back. I mean, just the other day, on those nice days, you you know, when you can go out, uh, there was probably, you know, four, five, six of them flying overhead, making their, you know, singing away. So, love it. Yeah, that's great. Now, ospreys really been a success story as far as, 
you know, their population is really coming back oh, you know, yeah. here and also across the country. Yep. Well, nature of your all souls to think about is actually really the, you know, the perfect recycler. You know, everything in nature is used over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, the water that you use or the water that you drink today, those same water molecules was water that maybe a dinosaur drank in the past. Okay. Uh, yeah, I usually tell my students when I do a school program that, you know, you may have drank the same water that a famous person drank in the past, you know, like George or Martha Washington, for example. There you go. <laughs> now, filters, uh, nature filters water all the time? Yeah, that's right. Nature is a tremendous filtering system. You know, think about ocean water when it evaporates mm -hmm. and goes into the air to make rain. You mm -hmm. know, we don't have salt water rain. The salt stays in the water in the ocean and it gets purified and we have, uh, you know, clean water. So what did you just drink, Rory? Uh, coffee. Coffee. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so uh, how do you keep the coffee grinds from getting into your coffee when you make <coughs> coffee? <laughs> I don't filter my coffee. No, I use a filter. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, that wouldn't be good having coffee grinds in <laughs> no, your I, coffee. I use a filter. and Okay. We, we're kind of coffee snobs. So, you know, we oh. grind it and then we filter, you know, we, we put it in a filter and use filtered water too. Wow. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I have some filtered water here. We don't actually, I don't even drink coffee. Can you imagine? I probably had like five cups of coffee in my whole life. Really? I that's mean, it. when you do, you must be, you know, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, we have a water filter. Obviously, there you go. Enough. Can you see that? Yep. You know, we have the, the same picture. one. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, here's the filter, obviously, that goes inside of it. Yep. So yep. a lot of people have those in their homes, you know, to help uh, filter some of the water. Sure. So, um, guess what? What? I think I'm going to leave for a minute. Why? I'll be right back. Where are you going? I'm going to the basement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what? You need two minutes again? I do. Yeah. I'm going to show right. you something in the basement. All right. Two minutes then. That's it. Go. Okay. Go. Hey, Rory, I'm in the basement. I see that. What's going on down there? Well, I wanted to show you this big filter over here I have. I see that. Gosh, that is a huge filter. What does that do? Well, this is actually what's called a uh, acid neutralizer filter. Okay. And the reason I have this is that in a lot of places along Long Island, our water here is very acidic. Okay. So there's acid in the water. There's naturally here from the rain that we get. So if I don't have this filter, uh, uh, you can have actually pinholes uh, in your copper pipes. So this changes the acidity and makes it more neutral. So there's less acid in the water. Okay. You know, my dad was a plumber and he said pretty much the same thing. He, we lived right near a farm and uh, he actually installed a filter that looked just like that, but it was for Temic, which was a mm -hmm. type of, you know, pesticide that they used back then. And they, just like the DDT, they realized that, you know, they couldn't, they had to stop using it and it got in the ground set water and Suffolk County came along and tested all of our water and we ended up having to install the, uh, the filter in there, which was good. I'm glad we found that out. Yeah, but, no, it's really uh, important. Obviously, you know, you don't want those uh, chemicals in your, your drinking water. No. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, anything else you want to show me in the basement? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> do you have like an area that's uh, a mess down there? Uh, I think we do. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you have one as well. I do. All right. I'll see the you back. The storage area. All right, Rory. Bye. Well, welcome back from the basement, Mr. C. Um, now, you mentioned you had a well, right? Yeah, that's right, Rory. Right in the front yard. That's where the well is. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we get it from, uh, we get our water from Suffolk County. I used to have a well, but they were, they put the line right in front of our house. They offered it to, uh, to us for free. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know what, let's go that route. But they, they do all the filtering and I think that they have their own well, right? Yeah. I mean, most people, when you think you get Suffolk County Water Authority, they have wells all around Long Island. Mm -hmm. So Everyone who lives on Long Island in Suffolk County, actually even in Nassau County, we get all our water from underground in the aquifer. Right. So that's why it's important we don't put any pollutants on the land because eventually it will percolate into the groundwater and we'll drink it. Right. Uh, and this right. is called an, an aquifer. So if you go to you know, New York City, uh, they don't get their water from obviously underground. There are right. big reservoirs upstate. Oh, yeah. Yep. In the Catskills. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, in fact, in the 1980s, I actually lived 
near their largest reservoir in their system called the Ashokan Reservoir, right below the dam. Yeah, and we have a cabin uh, right near the Papactan Reservoir. And I think there's a, there's a third reservoir too, isn't there? Yeah, there's a few of them. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what the name of that one is, but uh, right. Yeah, no, it's it's nice, clean water that they have. I'm telling you, it's good good no, stuff. New York City actually has some of the best best in the country for you know a big municipality. Yeah. So don't you have a video we could show everybody about groundwater, Rory? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, here it is. We use clean water every day of our lives, from brushing our teeth to washing our faces. Drinking, cooking, cleaning, watering flowers, and crops all use this clear liquid we call water. The French say, l'eau est la vie. We say, water is life. Where does this water we use on a daily basis come from? Well, here in Suffolk County, rain and melting snow soak into our sandy soils and are trapped in pores, spaces between sand, gravel, and pebbles underground. This water supply in the ground is called an aquifer. All 1.5 million residents of Suffolk County use groundwater as our sole source of fresh water. Water is added to this aquifer by the 44 inches of rain or snow melt we receive on an average each year. So when it rains, if there are pollutants on the land, the resulting stormwater either carry pollutants into our local surface water bodies as runoff or soak into our groundwater. One such pollutant of concern is nitrogen. Nitrogen from improper fertilizer use, pet waste, wildlife, and septic systems enter both surface water bodies and groundwater. High levels of nitrogen can cause toxic algal blooms that are harmful to our local marine life. Brown tide or red tide algae blooms are harmful to fin fish and shellfish. So to help protect local water bodies and groundwater, we all need to do the following. Use water wisely. Don't waste it. Pick up pet waste. Make sure vehicles are not leaking fluids. Keep a septic system working properly and have it pump regularly. Dispose of hazardous household wastes, like pesticides, paints, oils, or chemicals properly. Check with your local town for hazardous waste pickup days. Use lawn pesticides and fertilizers sparingly, or not at all, and follow recommended concentration and appropriate time listed on label. And remember, Suffolk County law states that there is no fertilizer use between November 1st and April 1st. The clean water we enjoy today from the aquifer and our local water bodies will need to be just as clean or cleaner for future generations of Long Islanders. So Mark, uh, stormwater pollution is something we all need to be aware of, right? And, and we have to improve our water quality. Yeah, you're right, Roy. Uh, the video mentioned, you know, nitrogen, for example, and you know, harmful mm -hmm. algae blooms like brown tide and mahogany tide and, and red tide. Um, I've got another video uh, and uh, Chris Pickerel, uh, who is our uh, Marine Program Director, tells us about the Cornell Marine Project using shellfish to remove nitrogen in local surface waters. The Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project is the first of its type and of its scale. It's actually a huge project initiated in 2018 through the help of the Governor's Office of New York State DEC. And as part of this project, we're producing hundreds of millions of shellfish to put in local waters, both clams and oysters. The clams are single clams, the oysters are spat on shell, which is something kind of interesting and, and unique in that most people think of oysters as the single animals that you eat, but these are clusters of oysters on shell, on dead shell, which works very well for creating reefs. So the sanctuary sites are spread throughout Long Island. There are five locations. Uh, I believe there are three in Suffolk and two in Nassau. And the idea there is that we put high densities of shellfish in relatively small locations, get them concentrated. So being that they are filter feeders, they'll remove everything that passes over them in the water column. So in this case, we're looking to remove algae and particulate matter and deposit it on the bottom or incorporate it into the shellfish themselves. And these are sites are situated in such a way that they're at um, areas of kind of uh, marginal water quality, so not very good water quality, not very poor water quality, but between those areas. And the thought is that these uh, filter feeders can act as a barrier and as the poor water quality passes over these sites, it gets cleaned up. So we're expecting them to spawn over the years and contribute to the adjacent water bodies 
and add to both the recreational and commercial fishing industry, which is important to us. And that's effectively what we're trying to do. Plants are also uh, important in help water quality, just like animals are, like in the last video talked about shellfish. You know, Ron Paulson, who works for Cornell Extension, uh, does a lot of groundwater work. Uh, he worked in a project in East Hampton, I believe, uh, that yeah, dealt I, with. I, Go ahead. Inter I interviewed him, and uh, I've got another clip for you. Great. And so we did that survey here of measuring the pore fluids that are the fluids that groundwater is really discharging through. And we did that in the pond, and we also did that in the upper reach of the harbor here. And through that, we were able to identify several areas that had a lot of groundwater discharge with a lot of nitrogen in them, and were having a detrimental effect on the water quality. Kim Manzo, our seahorse expert we had on last week, also works with seaweeds. I think we have a clip of her working in the Akabonic Harbor project as well. So on day one of the, the launch of the experiment, uh, we brought all the seaweed down here. I had help from um, the town of East Hampton. A, a few folks came out and uh, helped me clip the seaweed to the seaweed frames. We had a total of 30 frames, and each frame held 25 pieces of seaweed. We started off using mostly gracilaria, um, but we did utilize ulva for the three intertidal frames, being that they would be more likely to be able to withstand the desiccation of being exposed at, at low tide. So the project was successful. We had very good growth of the macroalgae. Um, it basically either doubled or tripled in size over the course of a month. We also had great results in terms of the nitrogen extraction. Um, the most interesting results were the frames that we actually placed within the creek that drains Pussy's Pond, as well as the intertidal frames along the, um, the marsh bank, which were areas that, within the Trident report, did have the most um, significant amounts of nitrogen within the groundwater. And sure enough, the macroalgae had the highest tissue nitrogen at the end of the experiment at those in, within those frames. Mr. C, uh, what what other thing is uh, should we tell everybody about um, our our groundwater? Well, you know, hopefully everyone uh, realizes what we showed them today. How water is really important. You know, we we live on an island, and sometimes we forget about it. You know, we're surrounded mm -hmm. by salt water, but obviously we need fresh water and clean water uh, for drinking. So uh, water is very important for use in our homes and also for clean water for shellfish and even you know recreation people like to go boating and fishing and, and swimming and go to the beach and um, in fact uh, the recreational commercial fish is here in New York State uh, contributes about 3.7 billion dollars uh, to our New York State economy you know almost every year well mark I think I need to get uh, some water in my uh, my little bottle here uh, so I want everybody to remember to help keep our waters clean. See you next time. If you want more information and more materials, please go to our website, www.ccesuffolk.org forward slash marine. Look for our digital education initiative link on the lower left part of the page. As I looked yesterday, there's more references to the digital learning page as well. So if you go there, you'll definitely see it. Now we've been putting together some teacher and student resources, art initiatives, quizzes, and some really good and informative videos. So see you next time on Cornell Marine's Digital Learning Podcast. <laughs>